Hello everyone, so before I get into today's video, I would like to talk about a few things. Throughout America's history, there have been on and off cycles when it comes to the stigma of age disparate love. In the late 1970s, there were toy boy unions where women married men about five years their junior, and in 2003, a report revealed that 34% of women over the age of 40 were dating younger men. We have all heard of the term cougar in more recent years. When it comes to why men seek young women, though, there could be a variety of reasons why. Maybe the innocent attraction, energy and vitality, or innate ancestral echoes. Way before any of us were ever born, men chose mates based on reproductive success, so it was normal to choose a young and healthy woman over an older woman. Times have changed, though, and more people see the darker side of couples with a big age gap. They look at the manipulation and control, narcissistic motives, and more. I once saw an interview where an older gentleman admitted he only likes them young because he can mold them into being who he wants them to be, and he can get them to do what he wants them to do. Let's take a look into some people we might know who have been in relationships with big age gaps. As I'm reading off these couples, let me know in the comments below what the first feelings you have about them come to mind. Is it their accomplishments, or is it the negative or positive feeling about their age gap relationship? Elvis met Priscilla when he was 24 and she was 14. 72-year-old Bill Murray is with 43-year-old singer Khalees. 83-year-old Al Pacino is with 29-year-old Noor Alfala. 79-year-old Robert De Niro is with 45-year-old Tiffany Chin. 40-year-old Olivia Wilde is with 30-year-old Harry Styles. In more recent news, 21-year-old Aoki Lee Simmons, who was once on live telling her dad that if he did not raise her allowance, she was going to find a sugar daddy, is now dating 65-year-old Serafina restaurant group owner, Vittorio Asaf. Now this brings us to the couple I am featuring today. 17-year-old Janine Marie Snyder met her friend's father, Michael Thornton, a man in his 40s, and the two hit it off. Their relationship was fueled on drugs and evil thoughts and actions. Their love twisted into a pact of blood, shadows, and death. Bodies piled up, and the courtroom whispered of their sick and twisted behavior. Now, both are on death row. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Janine Marie Snyder was born on September 26, 1979. She grew up in Southern California, and although there is not much on her early life, reports claim that her home life was challenging. There was so much friction that Janine ran away from her home when she was either 13 or 14 years old. Some say she was kicked out because she was already using and she was very difficult and hard to raise. Janine was now running the streets of Riverside County, California, and just for some background information, in the early 2000s, the Riverside violent crime rate was close to 600 per 100,000 of the population, and over the next few years, there was a spike in crime and it was getting closer to 700 per 100,000 of the population. Janine was alone, but she did stay in contact with a few friends. She made a living stripping part-time in Vegas, but she would frequently make her way back to Rialto, California. In 1996, when Janine was 16 or 17, one of her 16-year-old friends introduced Janine to her parents. The friend expressed to her parents that Janine had a rough life and had no place to stay. This young girl's father, 41-year-old Michael Thornton, agreed to allow Janine to live with him and his family. Before we get into what happened after Janine moved in, let me tell you a little about Michael Thornton. Michael was born in 1955 and had a normal upbringing in his middle-class family. His first job was working at a grocery store, and when he officially became an adult, he joined the Air Force. After leaving the Air Force, Michael decided to settle down, so he got married and he and his wife had one son together. Things were going well in their marriage, and Michael's wife had no ill feelings towards Michael or their marriage. That soon changed when Michael's wife caught him doing the unthinkable. One day, for whatever reason, the Thornton household had at least one visitor, and that visitor was a six-year-old. Michael thought he was in the clear, and only he and the young visitor were alone. Because of his wishful thinking, he began to take advantage of her. To Michael's surprise, though, his wife was nearby and walked in on Michael sexually assaulting the innocent visitor who was too innocent to understand what was going on. 
Unlike some spouses who brush incidents like this under the rug and or forgive their significant other, Michael's wife did the opposite. She was extremely disgusted and called Michael out on his deplorable act. She immediately filed for divorce, and the divorce was finalized with no issues, but there was a nasty custody battle that took place. Of course, his now ex-wife was scared of Michael being alone with their son, and most likely expressed her discomfort of Michael and his ability or inability to be a caretaker. In quoting a law firm in California, they state that in California, the courts are supposed to make whatever decisions they believe are in the child's interest with regard to custody and child support. A mother can lose custody for a few reasons, neglecting their child, assaulting their child, violating a court order, addiction or substance abuse, and lastly, domestic violence. I have heard of mothers like Michael's ex who were uncomfortable because a sexual assault was witnessed and despite a court order being in place where the child can still see the father, they keep the child away from the father, which essentially violates the court order and the child is taken away from the mother and dad wins custody. It is not clear how Michael's ex did not win sole custody of their son, but she didn't and despite Michael's horrific acts, he's the one who won sole custody of their son. Michael moved on from his messy divorce and custody battle. He met a new woman named Pamela, and the two eventually got married and had a daughter together. Now, Michael had a son and a daughter. Michael's daughter was born around the same time Janine was born, so keep that in mind. Now, just like his first marriage and how things went from great to horrible, the same thing happened in his marriage with Pamela. Michael was not a fun-loving husband anymore. He began assaulting his whole family and would even threaten them with weapons. Fast forward to 1996. Michael's daughter was now 16 years old, and even though she herself did not grow up in the best of households, she asked her father Michael if Janine could live with them for a bit. When Janine moved in, she and Michael immediately hit it off. It did not matter that Janine was decades younger than Michael. Age was nothing but a number to both of them. Before things became sexual, they hit it off because they were both using meth. They became codependent on one another. Janine was a part-time stripper in Las Vegas, Nevada, but she would always make her way back to Southern California to stay with Michael. They would feed off of each other. They were both going down a dark path, and eventually they started sharing their intimate secrets. Michael felt so comfortable that he confided with Janine and told her that he had sadistic fantasies that he wanted to make a reality. Michael expressed that he loved younger girls, girls in the same age range or younger than Janine. He ended up convincing Janine to help him make his fantasies come to life, and Janine agreed. I remember one time I was in an Uber, and there was a young girl who looked about 8 years old, and another woman who looked to be around 18 years old was with her. I initially thought they were siblings, but the older girl had a bag full of makeup and a change of clothes for the girl. The younger girl then began talking about how she snuck out, how she took her dad's credit card, and I was nosy and asked how they met and how they knew each other. The young girl said she met the older girl at the mall. The older girl in so many ways was trying to get the younger girl to be quiet, but still trying to be nice and forthcoming at the same time. It wasn't until later that I registered that this could have been a trafficking situation or worse. I brought up that story to say that this is the role Janine decided to play for Michael. She was young and many thought she was pretty or pleasing to the eyes. Janine's new job was to have young girls trust her enough so she could get them closer to Michael so that they could fulfill his fantasies. Now, during this time, Michael was a pretty successful man. He owned multiple hair salons in Southern California and was making money despite his addiction. In late 1996, the same year Michael and Janine met, they agreed who their first victim would be. Their decision came after an incident that happened at one of his salons. There was an employee by the name of Cheryl Peters who worked for Michael as a hairstylist. She worked there for a while with no issues, but on one particular day, she and Michael got into an argument at the salon. Now, meth users could be affected by horrible mood swings, but whatever the case may be, everyone in the salon thought Michael was in the wrong, so when Cheryl decided to quit on the spot and walk out, all of the other employees decided to walk out as well. Angered by this, Michael told Janine that their first victim would be Cheryl's 14-year-old daughter, Jesse K. Peters. Of course, if Michael knocked on Cheryl's door, the door might not have been answered. That's where Janine came into play. She was the cover. She knocked on Cheryl's door and was able to speak with Jesse. Janine used her charm and surprisingly was able to get innocent Jesse to leave her house and get in the car where Michael was in the driver's seat waiting. 
They then took Jesse to their house, not caring that they lived with other people and could possibly be caught. Jesse was restrained to a bed with handcuffs and then sexually assaulted. Not wanting her to go to authorities or tell anyone what he had done to her, Michael decided that Jesse needed to die. He filled the bathtub halfway with water, uncuffed Jesse, and brought her to the tub. He submerged her head under the water until she died. If that wasn't bad enough, he then separated her body into pieces, loaded the parts in containers, and dumped her into the ocean. Poor Jesse was now somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. What's crazy about this is that Michael's wife Pamela actually overheard Michael talking about killing and dismembering someone, but she stayed quiet about it. Maybe because she was fearful of her own husband, but whatever the case may be, she did not tell anyone about what she heard. Over the years, Janine and Michael continued using and continued sleeping with young girls throughout Southern California and Las Vegas. In 2001, Janine and Michael took another trip to Vegas, and Michael spotted 16-year-old Michelle Curran by herself, and he decided that she would be their next victim. Michael was driving, and Janine was in the passenger seat when he spotted Michelle. When Michael specifically chose Michelle, Janine knew the drill. As soon as the car parked, Janine immediately got out of the car and walked up to Michelle. Just like every other young girl Janine was able to trick and or manipulate, Janine used her charm to gain Michelle's trust within minutes. The two clicked, and Michelle's guard was completely down. Michelle agreed to walk with Janine and get inside of the vehicle with a man in his late 40s behind the wheel. Reports claim that Michelle was walking to school, so who knows if Janine offered Michelle a ride to school. When Michelle got in the car, Michael went straight to his sadistic business. He told Michelle that he had a gun, and she needed to listen to every demand, command, request, or anything else you can think of. Michelle had no way out and didn't even think of escaping because she believed she would die if she made the slightest attempt. One day turned into a couple of days, a couple of days turned into a week, and a week turned into two weeks. That's how long Janine and Michael held Michelle against her will. Michelle was sexually assaulted by Michael and Janine at the same time and from each one of them separately multiple times. Michelle was threatened and in so much fear that she never dared to escape. Janine and Michael had even taken her out in public before, but Michelle always looked calm as if she was just casually walking with friends. When the two-week mark was almost approaching, Michael and Janine felt as if Michelle knew too much about them. She spent all day, every day with them for weeks. She could describe their facial features, private areas, and more. She knew too much, and the only way for her not to release any information about them to anyone like authorities, they came to the conclusion that Michelle needed to die. The trio made their way to Ribadeau, California, a small city of about 30,000 inhabitants and west of Riverside. They found a horse ranch and decided that that was the place they were going to kill Michelle. They assumed it was spacious enough that they would never get caught. Michael and Janine were equipped with a gun, but instead of killing Michelle in a painless and quick way, they decided to mess with her and assault her first because inside of a room on the ranch were ropes, ties, and other things that lit the sadist couple's eyes. When they were done with their twisted fun and Michelle was sexually assaulted one last time, Michael gave Janine a gun and Janine pulled the trigger. Michelle was fatally shot in the head. After killing Michelle, both Janine and Michael began running off the property. Thankfully, the property owner had just arrived and spotted them running on her property, so she called the cops thinking they were thieves. By the time authorities arrived, Janine and Michael were still running on the property owner's land. Authorities began searching the ranch, and when they made it to a stable tack room, they found blood everywhere. Blood, but no victim. They knew something worse than a burglary happened, but they had no body. Janine and Michael were arrested that same day on April 17th. Detectives found Michael's vehicle, and they found weapons, tape with hair on it, and Michelle Curran's ID. They ran her name, and it came up that Michelle was listed as a runaway or missing. Police were able to get in contact with Michelle's mother, Candy Curran, and upon finding out what happened back at the ranch and how her daughter's ID was found, she said, She didn't know who they were. She threw her ID in their truck because she knew what was going on. Do you think they would keep that in there? At that point, police still did not know if Michelle was taken against her will or if she was a willing participant to Janine and Michael's crimes. Authorities did also find out, though, from Michelle's older sister that she was the last one to see her sister before they reported her missing. 
Before Michelle headed off for school, she told her older sister that she was going to stop at McDonald's or another fast food restaurant to get some breakfast before school started. After more digging, authorities found out that the trio checked into a hotel called the Main Street Inn on April 2nd, and they checked out on April 4th. The night of April 4th, the trio left Nevada and made their way to California, checking into the Lake Arrowhead Lodge in Arrowhead, California. On April 5th, Candy Coran filed a missing persons report with the Las Vegas police. Janine and Michael did not want to stay put in one hotel for too long, so on April 6th, they left California and drove all the way to Mesa, Arizona, and stayed at Michael's mother's house until April 11th. When it was time to leave this house, who knows if it was forced, but there was a letter left behind that was signed by Michelle that said Michael and Janine were treating her well. This could have been written because Michael's mother believed Michelle was a friend of her son. The trio left Arizona on April 11th, and they drove all the way back to California and made it there on April 12th. Days passed that investigators were not able to account for, and it wasn't until April 17th where they all checked into a Motel 6, and that was the same day Michelle was killed. Mind you, authorities still did not know if Michelle was officially killed. Since there was no body yet, she was missing. Police ended up releasing a photograph of Michelle and Janine together. The image depicted Michelle sitting in Michael's mom's beige GMC Suburban. Michael had been using her car for his long road trips from state to state. This particular photograph that was snapped was actually a Polaroid that was found by a detective in one of the hotels they were staying in in Ribadeau, California. Police did not think Michelle looked like she was in danger. It was Janine and Michelle in the picture, so they assumed Michael took the picture. Police also had eyewitness testimony from people who saw the trio at different hotels, and they all said Michelle did not seem to be under any duress. It seemed like they all knew each other and were friends. Despite authorities being unsure, Candy Coran knew her daughter did not know Michael nor Janine and was taken against her will. Michael and Janine were both in jail on breaking and entering charges, and they were both given $1 million bonds. The bond was that high because of the blood at the scene and a missing person's ID being found in their vehicle. Michael and Janine weren't talking, and police were at a standstill until April 22nd, five days after Janine and Michael got arrested. The property owner of the ranch found Michelle's poor body in a storage shed for horse equipment. With Michelle's body now found, Michael and Janine were now charged with murder along with other charges. During trial, some young women came forward and testified they had previously been victims of Janine and Michael. They recounted how they were lured, tricked, held against their will, and sexually assaulted multiple times. All of the women had another thing in common. Remember I told you Michael and Janine were meth heads? Well, they would take these clean girls and give them meth before they were sexually assaulted. One of these girls said she was held for about 30 days, and when she was finally released, she and her parents did go to authorities and an arrest was made. Michael and Janine were charged by San Bernardino County prosecutors, but the case was eventually dropped due to lack of evidence. Janine and Michael were on a high, literally and figuratively, because they continued to get away with their crimes. Although Michael and Janine were not charged with killing Jesse Peters due to lack of evidence, the court was made aware of her death because of Janine. Janine's attorneys were making it seem like Michael was the mastermind because he was much older and was able to take advantage of Janine. Janine met with a psychiatric expert, and it was in their meeting that Janine confessed to killing 14-year-old Jesse Peters, the only child of the hairstylist who worked for Michael in California. Janine told the psychiatrist that although she lured Jesse into the car, it was Michael who did the sexual assaulting, killing, and dismembering. Michael's ex-wife also took to the stand, and some believe she should have kept this information to herself, but she said she knew Michael had dismembered and dumped a body at Dana Point because she overheard him talking about it. People were shocked and angry that she would not report such an admission she overheard. The court was also made aware of the fact that along with Michelle's ID being found in Michael and Janine's car, or Michael's mom's car to be exact, they also found maps with addresses to schools in the Riverside area. This proved that the couple knew what they were doing, and they knew the types of victims they wanted to target. Detectives also presented a tape where Michael, Janine, and a third woman were all having intercourse together. Michael and Janine weren't charged for the tape because they had no way to tell if the third woman was under the age of 18 or not. They believe she looked to be 18 or older, and that is the age of consent in California. In closing statements, 
Prosecutors wanted to make it known that Janine was a willing participant and not a sheep following orders. She was just as guilty as Michael. Michael and Janine were both found guilty, and before sentencing, Michelle Coran's family members were able to make statements. Candy Coran said that she had been waiting six years for that very moment where Michelle's killers would be found guilty. Candy struggled to get out complete sentences because she was crying and overcome with so much emotion. Richard Coran, Michelle's uncle, said, I can't even look at these people. They disgust me. He then looked directly at Michael and said, You low-life scumbag. He then spoke to both of them again. You're looking downward. That's where they'll be going. When it was time for sentencing, Michael and Janine were both given death sentences. They were sentenced to death on September 7, 2006. 40-year-old Janine Marie Snyder is currently being held at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California, and her date of arrival was September 13, 2006, almost a week after she was sentenced to death. Michael is being held at the men's facility, which is San Quentin Prison in Northern California. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below. Do you guys think this was all Michael's fault because of his age? Did he manipulate and trick Janine into doing what he wanted? Do you feel bad for Janine? She was kicked out of the house as a young teen because she was using meth. Should her parents be responsible for not getting her help? How does the mind change when you are using meth during puberty? I'll see you guys in the comments.